All right, good morning. Uh, hopefully that's not too loud. I'll back up a little bit. <laughs> I'm Bill Moore, uh, retired Army and DOD senior executive and, uh, and the chair of the AUSA Civilian Advisory Committee. Um, General Brown and I go way back and he asked me to come on board and try to help further the cause for, uh, for Army civilians and how AUSA can support Army civilians. So I was really honored to be asked to do that and, uh, and I'm really enjoying the role. And, and on behalf of, of General Bob Brown, the President and CEO of AUSA and the Board of Trustees, I welcome each of you to the 2023 uh, AUSA Civilian Showcase. Thanks for coming. Um, as you all know, the Army is all about people and Army civilians play a critical role in Army current and future readiness and I think we'll get into that to some degree. Our theme for today's event is Innovating Today for the Future Ready Army of 2030. We plan to share how we are innovating for the future with a dynamic panel representing three of our major commands. One of AUSA's goals is to provide professional development to Army civilians as well as to build and foster professional relationships and I think we're doing that very well at this particular conference. General Brown is really I think breathe some new life into AUSA and the energy at this conference is, is uh, better than I've seen in many many years at AUSA and it's uh, it's been awesome to see that and he wants that to spill over in what AUSA does for Army civilians. Today's civilian showcase is really the last civilian event we'll have at this year's a, uh, annual convention and uh, but it's the culmination of several things that have gone on over the course of the week. Yesterday AUSA hosted 11 career field discussions where the functional chiefs and the program managers for the Army's civilian career fields uh, had the opportunity to sit in a room with careerists and talk about professional development and where, where those career fields are going in this that very dynamic environment. And uh, myself and a few others opened those events and they I thought they were hitting it out of the park with what the functional chiefs, what they were uh, getting across to the careerists and, and the careerist feedback on what they thought they needed in order to advance their careers. So it's uh, that was great. We also hosted the, um, the AUSA, well, the Army's SES seminar, as we call it this morning, kind of a breakfast meeting where we gathered most of the Army senior executives into a room and, uh, and we had some great discussions about talent management and what uh, what the professor called operational shift or drift, and uh, and that was pretty interesting stuff. And and how you uh, got to keep your eyes on the ball and uh, and what you're trying to achieve with the mission. So um, I did want to talk to you. So if you're here, you received a basic free membership for with AUSA, which is a which is a big deal and a and a big difference of years past. AUSA membership as it grows and it's grown exponentially over the past year or two. Uh, that helps AUSA have a stronger voice with Congress and with the department. So, um, so I would encourage you all to join AUSA and, uh, and look into the premier membership where you get additional perks uh, and uh, which are really, I think, important as we meet, try to meet AUSA's goal to better serve the Army and better serve Army civilians. Um, we also uh, hosted the Army Civilian Advisory Committee uh, this this week as well. We did that yesterday afternoon. Uh, value the insight and support of those who sit on the committee, and uh, and I did want to recognize those members. That, so if y'all would stand, uh, Miss Diane Randon. I don't know if Diane has made it here yet, because uh, I know she had several things to do. There you are. Thank you for being here, uh, Randy Robinson. Uh, Randy, uh, I know I saw Randy. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and we've got two advisors to the committee, Don Tyson, I know Don's in the room, thank you Don for your support, and Phil Sackwitz, a former chairman of the uh, advisory committee, so thank you Phil for supporting. We, um, as we look and try to reinvent how AUSA supports Army civilians, I am looking at expanding the board to some degree, so you may get a phone call or two from me as we, uh, as we look, look into that. So with that, um, I would like to welcome Dr. Agnes Garibin Schaefer. The, uh, she is the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. And thank you so much for coming today and, and speaking. Um, it, it's going to take me a minute to get through all the things she's responsible for, but it is a long list. As the Assistant Secretary, she leads 
of course, the manpower, personnel, and reserve component affairs for the Department of the Army and, and is the principal advisor to the Secretary of the Army for policy and performance oversight of human resources, training, readiness, mobilization, military health affairs, force structure, manpower management, equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity, marketing, and other critical aspects of, of the job. So uh, just a long list. Um, Dr. Schaefer's prior career assignments include being a senior advisor to the Deputy Secretary of Defense and Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, which was my boss in my last job, and, uh, and being a senior national security researcher at the RAND Corporation, a federally funded research and development center for the Department of Defense, where she provided nonpartisan objective research and analysis and developed a deep understanding of the Department of Defense over a 17-year run at RAND. So thank you for that service. So with that, ma'am, I will hand the, the podium over to you and appreciate you coming. How about a round of applause? Well, thank you so much for those wonderful words um, and the introduction. Um, a few about Five weeks ago, um, we also found out uh, in MNRA that we now have uh, responsibility for equids, our all army equids, and that has turned into all army animals. So in addition to what you mentioned, apparently I'm now a zookeeper too. So, um, so um, good morning everyone. Um, good morning to the panelists um, and attendees, thank you um, so much for joining us um, for this AUSA Civilian Showcase. Um, it's a great privilege to stand here before you today um, alongside some remarkable Army leaders on our panel, um, including Lieutenant General uh, Gervais, Lieutenant General Mohan, um, and Ms. Karen Payne. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, as some of you know, when I came into um, my position um, off the bat, I said that I wanted to elevate our attention on our civilian workforce um, and think about total force, not just reserve component, active component, but also our amazing uh, civilians. Um, so we're gonna be talking about um, ways in which we're preparing our force um, to evolve into the Army of 2030 through the power of innovation. Um, the history of our civilian workforce within the Army traces its roots back to the early days of the Continental Army. During that time, civilians served as clerks, diligently documenting and organizing information. Their efforts allowed our commanders to make informed decisions that ultimately led to victory in the fight for American independence. Throughout history, Army civilians have continued to play a pivotal role in the various military conflicts, contributing an array of skills and services from logistics to administration, research to technology. Civilians are an in integral part of our workforce, supporting our soldiers and ensuring they are equipped and prepared to face any challenge. The Army civilian population is currently 262,000 strong, and I extend my deepest gratitude for your unwavering dedication and commitment to our force. The Army would not be the Army without you. Speaking of dedication, I would also like to acknowledge um, and celebrate our outstanding participation in the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. Uh, the Office of Personnel and Management has revealed that the Army ranked first among the service branches um, in participation rates. The Civilian Human Resources Agency led the charge with an impressive 54.4% participation rate, followed by US Army North at 50%, and Space and Missile Defense Command at 46.7%. This achievement is a testament to our collective commitment to excellence. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. In January 2023, I joined the Manpower and Reserve Affairs Office and have had the honor to work with an absolutely amazing team that works tirelessly to enhance the lives of our Army soldiers, 
civilians and their families. Throughout my professional journey, my focus has revolved around improving the Army's readiness to align with the objectives of our national security strategy, specifically improving the quality of life of our active reserve and component uh, members and their families. A healthy force is a ready force. And I firmly believe that if we take care of our people, we, we, our people will take care of the nation. Moreover, my overarching priority is the strategic modernization of our personnel policies, processes, and systems across our entire spectrum of the Army people strategy. This encompasses how we recruit and hire, how we nurture and manage talent, and how we foster a workplace culture that empowers civilians to thrive and advance our careers uh, within the Army. Our efforts are dedicated to highlighting cross-cutting issues such as increased permeability across the total force, enhanced flexibility in talent management and career opportunities, and the improved alignment of people's competencies with both civilian and military career fields. These endeavors are designed to optimize operations for our civilians and elevate the overall quality of our personnel. The Civilian Implementation Plan, an integral component of the Army People Strategy, places special emphasis on hiring civilians and ensuring that the Army remains competitive and attracting top talent, even when compared to our other, other employers. We cannot afford to lose sight of the efforts required to recruit the necessary skill sets and personnel to main, re, maintain robust career paths, guarantee immediate and long-term readiness, and construct the Army of 2030 in the face of adversity. That's why innovation is critical now more than ever. And as, if anybody knows me, um, you know that innovation is something that I have very much embraced and have been nudging the system. Um, across the Army. Um, I know that change is hard, um, but we really, really need to attack this um, on both the civilian and the military side. Innovation at its core is about discovering new and better ways of doing things. It's not limited to technology alone. It encompasses innovative ideas, new ways of managing, and fresh perspectives and processes towards age-old challenges. It's about embracing change and adapting to stay relevant in today's rapidly evolving world. Let me share with you how we are harnessing innovation with a few accomplishments from the civilian implementation plan that deserve some recognition. First, we launched an onboarding program for new Army civilians. The Civilian Human Resources Agency is executing an enterprise-wide onboarding program while Army commands are implementing local onboarding programs at their respective locations. This ensures that our new hires are equipped with the tools and knowledge they need to excel from day one. We've established and resourced a supervisor development and certification program. We understand that effective leadership is crucial to our success. Hence, we have developed a comprehensive mandatory supervisor development and certification program to nurture and equip our leaders with the skills they need to guide their teams towards success. And lastly, we identified Army's mission critical occupations for FY24 and 25. Our team is giving these mission, mission critical occupations priority when allocating positions in civilian personnel acquisition programs. This ensures that our most critical roles are staffed with the best talent. Our workforce is evolving. For example, attitudes are changing about job security and what a professional journey looks like. Gone are the days when people joined an organization for 30 years. Today, we, we encourage job hopping every four to five years um, to gain diverse experience and stay on ahead of our careers. Our workers themselves are also changing. As we operate in an increasingly competitive environment, managing talent across multiple generations becomes tantamount. We have people entering the workforce who have grown up with our newest means of technology, and those are still adapting to it. Uh, we bridge these knowledge gaps and benefits from the 
from the best of both worlds across cross-generational collaboration. This, this shift highlights the importance of solidifying an innovative workforce across our Army. But what exactly is an innovative workforce? And how do we build it? We cultivate a culture where innovation is not just encouraged, but expected. It means fostering an environment that promotes opportunity to maximize talents, and where every employee, from the newest recruit to the most seasoned leader, is empowered to think creatively and contribute ideas. If I have one accomplishment um, in my job while I'm in it, um, it is to minimize the number of times I hear change is hard. <laughs> um, I, I want us to embrace change um, because it means we are continuing, evol continuing to evolve. Um, so I'm hoping that during our, our discussions today we can really, really embrace that um, and share lessons learned about the things that commands have been doing um, and sharing those best practices because we do not do that um, enough. So our mission is clear. We are preparing our force to become the Army of 2030 through innovation. For the first time in history, the Army has fully defined civilian readiness at strategic, functional, organizational, and individual levels as part of the civilian implementation plan. These definitions are encapsulated in what we call Army Civilian Readiness Indicators. These indicators will guide us in developing a more comprehensive set of categorizations for the civilian workforce. Sorry. Um, addressing factors such as manning levels, training, technical competencies, and more. This work builds on the current measures used by the Army in its strategic readiness assessment process. And soon, much like our military personnel, the Army civilian team will be evaluated using these expanded readiness indicators. The outcome will be a real-time temperature check for the Army civilian workforce as they support the priorities of the Army and our nation. One crucial aspect of strengthening innovation in our workforce is telling the Army story. We must do a better job of promoting civilian jobs. We know we have a knowledge gap with the public. People still don't know that we have lots of opportunities for civilian careers in the Army. We're working hard to change that. I, for one, have never seen a commercial for an Army civilian. Um, and that breaks my heart, and we're going to change that. Um, I've been to several mentoring sessions um, with high school kids, and they don't know that we have Army civilians, um, and that breaks my heart too. So we really, really need to attack the issue of marketing and getting the word out about the amazing careers that you can have as an Army civilian. And again, I think that some of our, our panelists are going to be touching on how we can share those lessons learned on getting that word out. Remember, each Army soldier, civilian, and family member is a recruiter. Even our veterans can serve as sounding posts, mentors, offering valuable insights from their wealth of experience and their Army story. Our goal is to acquire and retain top talent, and this requires us to, to change the way we do things. We need to talk to each other about our Army experiences and why we decided to answer the call to service. We need conversations at the senior leader level and all the way down our ranks. A diverse, talented, strong, healthy, and resilient force is the most important indicator of our readiness. The Army's personnel, programs, and initiatives are focused on taking care of our people because we lead with our values and doing so is essential to the readiness required to accomplish our mission and defend those who depend on us. Let's embrace the power of conversation to foster innovation in our workforce. Let's refine what it means to be innovative, not just as individuals, but as an organization. Let's embrace our new programs and, and initiatives which promise to bring civilians from all walks of life into a life of service. Let's continue the conversation beyond today. Let's begin the conversation now.
It's through our collective efforts that we can shape a brighter and more innovative future for our organization. Our innovation starts with a conversation, and that's why we're here today. Together, we are partnering to ensure civilian uh, Army civilians are the best, brightest, and ready to support the warfighter and the future. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Ma'am, I did want to uh, just real quickly thank you for the insightful comments. It sounds like you've built a great plan, you've got the metrics to enable it, and now it's all about execution. So, uh, so thank you so much for taking that on. Um, on behalf of AUSA, I, I did want to give you a small token of our appreciation for speaking and, and glad that you can hang around for a little bit. But uh, thank you, ma'am, for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Do you want me to open it? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. Thanks. All right, let me find my place here. Um, and I would like to now invite our panelists to, uh, to the stage and, uh, and we can begin the panel. We're very fortunate to have Army senior leaders from the three commands that employ the largest number of Army civilians here with us today. Uh, following our panel discussions, um, we'll have some time for questions and answers, so, uh, so think about what questions you may want to ask these great leaders uh, once we get done. The panel discussions today are going to focus on where we are currently with our Army civilians and where we need to go in the future and how we're telling the Army story and trying to, you know, create a better depiction of how Army civilians really support the Army itself. So we have the honor of being joined by three exceptional leaders, each representing the dynamic relationship between our Army and civilian corps. Uh, when, you know, when you think about Army civilians, uh, people like to talk about the three components of our Army, the active duty, the reserve component, and the National Guard. Uh, but, but within the active duty component, about a third of that are Army civilians. They are dedicated to the Army's mission. They are working full time for the Army. As uh, far as I'm concerned, by definition, they are part of that active component of the Army. And, uh, and their mission is really simple. They serve those who serve. Uh, whether they're in a depot doing depot maintenance or they're a, in the Corps of Engineers doing engineering work for facilities, building facilities, et cetera, uh, so that, or, or they're training soldiers and developing leaders. So they, they do a lot of things serving the Army and making improving uh, readiness for, our, for both current and future readiness. And this panel to me stands as an, a testament uh, to the importance of the integration between military and civilian efforts. During this discussion, we'll dive into their insights, experiences, and perspectives. We'll explore how their leadership has empowered collaboration, innovation, hopefully a few pearls for you, ma'am, uh, and uh, resilience in the face of complex challenges. Without further ado, let's jump into today's civilian showcase. The panelists are Lieutenant General Mar Maria Gervais, Com General Gervais currently serves as the Deputy Commanding General and Chief of Staff of the Training and Doctrine Command down at Fort Eustis, Virginia, where I've spent a good portion of my career back and forth. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for coming. Lieutenant General Christopher Mohan. The, uh, please. General Mohan currently serves as the Deputy Commanding General and Chief of Staff of the Army Materiel Command down in Huntsville, Alabama. So thank you, General Mohan. He and I have known each other since he was a captain and I was about a GS-12. So, uh, so it's hard for me to say General Mohan, but uh, awesome, fun. awesome. <laughs> uh, you've done great things for the Army, Chris. But, uh, and Ms. Karen Payne. <laughs> Ms. Payne currently serves as the Director of Human Resources for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where they do a lot of innovative things, I think. And not to put any pressure on you, Karen, but... Uh, uh, with how they manage their talent in the Corps. So with that, we will pose three rounds of questions for our panelists, and I'd like to get started with round one. The, the Army recognizes the need to adapt changing operational requirements and emerging technologies in order to remain a future-ready force. During this first round, we'll discuss the current challenges each of these panelists 
face uh, within their commands and any lessons they may have learned along the way in overcoming these challenges. So let's get started with Ms. Payne. Ma'am, uh, first question is for you. Innovation is the practice of doing things differently through new methods, ideas, or products in order to meet a challenge. From your perspective, what is an innovative practice your command is using to address a current challenge? I think my mic is, can everybody hear me? Okay, so it's on. All right, fantastic. Well, um, thank you. Uh, and innovation, uh, I do love the word innovation. Uh, so just a little bit about the USACE. We're, uh, our mission is engineering solutions for the toughest engineering uh, challenges. And that's, uh, so wherever there's an engineering challenge, USACE is right there. We're about 38,500 uh, civilians and about 1,200 active duty reserve and National Guard. Um, so, I, you know, with the core, we never know. I'm, I'm an old ER nurse, and so I always kind of like, you know, I kind of consider the core as like a triage center. We never know what's going to come in next. We have our military side, but then we also have our civil works. Whenever there's a disaster or something that's coming going on, whether in the country or outside, uh, USACE is usually there standing uh, close, uh, right by uh, FEMA and, of course, Big Army, too. So because of that, uh, we we do have to innovate. You know, it's just, uh, I, you know, uh, we were talking about my, my group, uh, we, kind of the often uh, cited definition of insanity is doing things over and over and over again and having, expecting a different result, but always having the same result. Um, so with USACE, we're always looking for new ways to do things. Uh, main reason is because um, we've doubled in size just in the last few years, uh, and we just probably will continue to double in size uh, with all the things that's going on. So we really have to innovate. Um, that was kind of the basis of it, and what we do, even at our engineers, is that innovation. Uh, but one of the greatest barriers to our program is not having the right people. And uh, and that's why with, uh, with G General Spellman, uh, his number one thing is people, uh, because we have to have our folks in the uh, right people at the right place at the right time in order to be there for our country. Uh, and so that kind of is, is the start and the basis for what we're doing. I, when I came to USACE about five and a half years ago, um, you know, I'd ask some diff different data points like, how we have we gone? You know, how, how many people do we recruit? Um, how many are we retaining? And a lot of it was like, I'll give that to you, Ms. Payne, about three weeks, um, that data. And, and my staff, we are all looked at like, we just can't do this. We can't continue in having that delay. So one of the bases of things, and kind of thinking engineering-wise, is you have to have a base before you build the structure. People analytics is our base. So, uh, you know, the goal uh, is that we don't think do things on maybe, uh, uh, you know, that we, we kind of did always before and that that's why we're doing it now. It's really we need informed decision making to be able to make those decisions that will take us to the next level. And so in building that, um, we do have a people analytics team. Uh, Mr. Jerry Dorsey, who's in the audience here, is the lead for that. Uh, we are actually, uh, we have any, any kind of information you would like regarding people, and I mean whether it's recruitment, retention, training, workman's comp, uh, onboarding, if you're just trying to find somebody, we have it in our dashboards and it's at the fingertips of our commanders. So they can ask for reports if they like, but they can have it at their fingertips. And so they can, uh, they look in, into this information and it's real time, real data. Uh, so it's not three weeks old or a month old kind of thing. Um, so we have dashboards, we have uh, all these uh, metrics um, that is very important and I know the civilian implementation plan is really working, uh, looking at uh, people metrics. So uh, those are all in there. And then, uh, you know, we decided, hey, well, we really need to look at uh, people analytics across the command too and not just in HR. And so our command has been very active and we have all of our different divisions and I have to say I have great uh, uh, divisional commands and district commanders that are very interested in this. And so it wasn't a hard sell to be able to uh, work people analytics. And then with the help of MNRA and uh, many thanks to uh, MNRA for uh, allowing us to do this, we're gonna lead uh, the Army people analytics uh, team. And so the first meeting will be November. So after, if you have any points of contact, please send it to us and we'll be working with Dr. Four on this uh, with being able to bring up uh, people analytics because again, it's so important for that base. The other uh, issue that came is for innovation is so we have the people analytics, then we had to look, okay, well, how about uh, a platform? Uh, 
I don't know about you, but I don't like USA Jobs. Um, <laughs> been around a long time, and I just do not like USA Jobs. Hopefully, from somebody from OPM is not here, but uh, it is um, it's archaic. Um, it's really very non-user friendly, um, and I've had you know kids go in there, older folks, you know, uh, journeyman level, and just go in, and they all say the same thing. So we actually have a platform now. And um, we've got three modules. Uh, we've been working with Army and, and DOD on this, so many thanks again, MRA and uh, G1 team. Uh, that um, it's uh, there's three modules. One is uh, for career events. So when we go, we can tell at moments notice how many people we've seen at that point of time. And I know that uh, uh, Charles has been using uh, the, you know the uh, the vendor two yellow for this. But you can go in get get any information in it and be able to um, you can uh, look at different kinds of people if you're looking for engineers, civil, mechanical, etc. We have now over 12,000 resumes in our repository, um, and. Um, we're also going to be having one of our events just to look at our, 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 our people that are already in the, in the um, site. But the second module is internal. So anytime we're going to do deployments or uh, transfers, uh, we can use this. Um, and then third module, uh, which we will bring, bring it up very soon, is our direct hire authority. So any position that's covered by a direct hire authority, we will no longer have to use USA Jobs. We'll have a banner in USA Jobs, so if anybody's in there, they can hit, they can go into our URL and um, be in our system. Uh, because people do go in that, so we don't want to forget those folks. But uh, in order to get your resume, and it takes about two minutes, uh, it's very user friendly again. So uh, our positions, about 93% of our positions are covered by a direct hire authority. I do want to get to 100%, and so people that know me know that I always say that 100% direct hire authority, not only for USAs, but I think for Army um, is getting to that so, so that we can do creative things and be innovators. Uh, the third one is a Talent Acquisition Center for Excellence. So uh, we have full-time recruiters. Now they work with ACMA, uh, so we're not doing this alone. And, um, but uh, you know, with, with regards to being able to hire fast, and my other goal, and people laugh sometimes, uh, my team sometimes chuckles on this, but I want to do one-day hiring. Um, we're about 35 days for our direct hire authority, which is great. It's absolutely wonderful. But we've lost people in 35 days. And I do not want to lose anybody for in, uh, you know, whether it's industry or even another command, um, because we were too slow. And 35 days for the best engineer is just way too slow. Uh, one day is really where we should be at. So, this, uh, so the TASTE team, it's called Talent Acquisition Center for Excellence, is, has uh, full-time recruiters. Plus, we have over 300 identified people within USACE that are part of our Talent Acquisition uh, Community of Interest group. Some of those are full-time recruiters for their, either their command, the regional command or the district, or they're very interested. Now, I would say that's great. We have 300 people that are very interested, but I also want some structure to it because I like structure. So um, we actually have trainings. We have guidance and policy on uh, what those folks will do, roles and responsibilities. And we'll be having our second training in the second week in November. Uh, and if anybody's interested in maybe participating, please let me know. We can, uh, you know we have, we're going to be having a virtual or in-person down in Atlanta. Uh, the, uh, and that's really be proactive. Uh, again, reactive is no good. We've got to be proactive. One day hiring, uh, being able to identify that folks in that. Uh, with regards to uh, the proactive too, like we're going to be doing a new uh, grad um, uh, event in the fall. And actually while I was here yesterday, I was thinking this morning is I'm going to invite the parents to it. I want to invite the parents, so sorry, team. They're looking at me like, oh, no, Karen. Um, but I, you know, we have to get to parents and guardians of folks to get them interested and let them know about the Army, too, and about USACE. Uh, so uh, every, every step we kind of take, we want to you know, push that envelope a little bit more. And, of course, direct hire authority, being able to have those and being able to uh, get um, uh, things done with using non-traditional kinds of method. To go along with that, I would say um, the biggest thing is collaboration and communication and changing the culture of your organization. And being able to identify that uh, not every position needs to be panel. Like if, I always tell my managers, if you're paneling at a GS5, you've got uh, panel members, please find another occupation. Don't be a manager, because if you need to panel somebody at a GS5 level, you really probably should be doing something different. Uh, you know, let's make decisions and let's make them fast. Uh, so I will leave it at that. Yeah, over. Great, thanks, thanks, Ms. Payne. Breaking through the USA Jobs paradigm, that's innovation at work there. <laughs> that, 
<laughs> that thing's a challenge. But uh, all right, shifting over to General Mohan. Sir, uh, over the past decade, we've witnessed a significant shift in the career landscape. What's AMC doing differently to acquire and retain a civilian workforce that better supports the warfighter in the future, given this changing landscape? Yeah, hey, so, uh, so thanks for that question. And, and first, thanks for, for having me up here. And, and some people who are sitting in the uh, audience or online might ask, hey, so what's a, what's a military uh, uh, leader doing sitting on a panel like this? Um, but uh, look, simply put, we can't do it without you guys. Uh, we don't do it without you guys. And I learned uh, at the rank of colonel when I went to uh, an industrial facility, I commanded a depot, so I was exposed uh, very early in my uh, more strategic assignments to the power of the civilian workforce. And you can have you know, those epiphanies. And my epiphany was when I sat down with my first leader uh, meeting, and I call you guys leaders, uh, not managers, not supervisors, but I call you leaders. When I sat down in my first leader meeting and realized that unlike when I uh, commanded a battalion where I was the senior officer, but also the senior in the amount of experience, that that paradigm had shifted. Whereas we went around the room and every single one of my direct reports, my leaders had more experience than I did. And so I very quickly realized the keys to success uh, were, were leveraging those talents and leveraging their experience. And I went to school, quite frankly. Um, and, uh, and I learned so much more, and I think we were much more successful because of that. Uh, fast forward to, uh, to where we are right now, and I will tell you that, um, that in Army Material Command, I think we, we represent the best of military-civilian integration uh, of anywhere in the Army. Of course, I'm proud of what we do. No, no offense, <laughs> Maria, but, but, um, <laughs> but look, in all of our commands, um, we have dedicated civilians civilian SES is sitting right next to our uniform commanders. My counterpart, Marion Wicker, um, we sit beside each other at the table and, and work to solve all the hard problems we have, and there's plenty. Um, so leveraging that talent is incredibly important. And so what are we doing about it? Um, I will tell you that, um, that the way we look at it, you know, it's a, uh, it's a wheel, if you can imagine a wheel, right? And so, so you've got, um, acquire talent, develop talent, employ talent, and retain talent. But right in the middle of that wheel, and we've got, we've got uh, a strategy that, uh, that is being developed and is being rolled out by, um, by Christina Fries, our acting G1, um, and uh, Ms. Wicker. And so we've got strategic goals for each one of those, those, uh, those four tenants. But sitting in the middle is the culture piece. Uh, and culture is, I think, more important, is the most important thing. We have to sell um, the impact that our civilians make on a daily basis. You are not invisible. Um, our, our civilians right now, our teammates, my teammates, are, are the ones that are leading the charge when we talk about telemaintenance um, that we're doing with the, with the Ukrainian Army and our partners in Ukraine. Um, you go into any telemaintenance uh, uh, meeting, and, uh, and it's virtual, um, and we have linked um, our engineers um, uh, from across the Army our, our item managers with the actual crews that are firing the guns to help them solve tough challenges. And there won't be a green suitor there. Um, so again, we cannot do it without you. Um, and that culture piece of talking about the, uh, the, uh, the, the contributions, look, it's not just a career, it's a calling. We need to, um, uh, we need to attack that culture piece and the, the articulation of, of how important it is what our civilian workforce does, just like we're attacking the, uh, the recruiting challenges we have for green suitors right now. Um, so we're, we've got a, a lot of, in our strategy, we've got a lot of uh, uh, specific things that we're doing. Um, now look, um, I've never been on USA Jobs other than just take a look. I've never had to manipulate it, but I know just me having to take a look, it is challenging. <laughs> it is absolutely challenging. The size of the resumes that are required. So we have a pilot program to reduce, reduce it down to five pages. I think five pages is still too much. Um, but, uh, but I think that, um, that, uh, that we're on the right track. Um, we, are, we are being more targeted with um, the folks that we try to hire, the, the amount of money we pay them, um, and, uh, and pushing down those necessary authorities, uh, classification authorities, um, uh, direct hiring authority. I love what you're doing with direct hiring authority. We're pushing that down to the, to the absolute lowest level as well. Um, and then as we think about that, that upfront acquire piece, um, agree that, um, that uh, we are segmenting using data to segment 
all the different steps in the hiring process. And a lot of times, to be totally honest, we have found out that the enemy is us um, because hiring actions are sitting on, on leader's desk and it's taken too long to execute panels and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've segmented that out and now my boss, General Hamilton, is holding commanders responsible for, for those segments and pointing the finger back at us. Um, the other thing that uh, from that acquire piece is, is going after um, and rolling out. We've had su uh, tremendous success in uh, on-the-spot hiring at Baya, on-the-spot offers. Um, we have commands that are doing many Baya type events all across the uh, all across the United States, um, uh, particularly using those authorities that we that we um, that we uh, use during during those type of hiring events to uh, to shorten the hiring practice using direct hire, hire authority. Because let's face it, I agree, 35 days is is too long. 100 days. Who can go without a paycheck for 100 days? Um, and we have to acknowledge that. So um, I will tell you, it starts with the strategy for us, um, and then the implementation strategic implementation and accountability that's built into the system. All right. Thank you, Thank you General Mohea. Great. General Gervais, from the uniform perspective, uh, carrying on that theme that General Mohea outlined, what does the warfighter need from the Army Civilian Corps? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Okay, good, because my little green light is not lighting up, <laughs> no matter how many times I pushed it. So, excellent. Um, so first of all, um, Honorable Schaefer and the entire team, thank you for the opportunity to be sitting up here on this panel, um, really to be able to share some of the insights and the experience that I've had throughout the Army. And I'm going to tell you right now, I would not be sitting up here if it hadn't been for the great civilians that I had the pleasure of serving with throughout my career. And many are in here right now that took me under their wing. You know, we have Mr. Don Tyson. You know, who told at one point told me I spoke pig Latin because I was talking about chemical, biological, radiological, <laughs> nuclear, and he taught me how to make sure that you put it in translatable language so that people could understand. And then, you know, I have the former uh, Axum, Imcom, SESs that are in here: Dave Tyndall, Randy Robinson, and also Diane Randon, who took a young colonel under their wing because I was kind of different from everybody else in the command that I had. And the command just happened to be, you know, 98% civilian who was focused on, you know, the protecting our training lands. It was Army Environmental Command so that we could ensure readiness for the Army. And so I will tell you it's through those valuable experiences that I've gleaned and their mentorship, their leadership, and the role that they, being role models, that is one of the reasons that I am sitting up here. So I can't thank you enough for that. Now, as you take a look at the question, you know, from a uniform perspective, what does the warfighter need from the Army Civilian Corps? And I, I will tell you the, you know, the first thing, and my, my good buddy, who I, I agree, we have the best civilians, and we have the best civilians too, and the Corps <laughs> of Engineers, because we have the best civilians. But you know, as you take a look at it, the, the And we are going to build an app. I, I've had a couple of briefs on it. We gave them about 30 days, I think, to come up with something that would be um, that would be really good, and we've got uh, a couple of captains and some NCOs that are working on this from the software factory, and I think they're going to have a great solution. So I would invite you to look at it. Right now, it's just for, we're doing it for Fort Cavazos, but it is going to be something that we, that people are going to want to download, and I think that that's important. So you can have all the programs out there that are great, but if you don't know how to access them, you don't know how to find them, then that's very frustrating. Uh, the other thing that I think that we have to do in, uh, over the last two months, the, all of us have, I know the Sergeant Major of the Army and I have been out visiting uh, our troops, and the, they're, when, whether they're in Europe or on an exercise in the Pacific, their people are very happy to do their mission. Um, what is uh, frustrating oftentimes is predictability. People like to know what they're doing, when they're doing it, and have some level of predictability. So we may not talk about that in here specifically, uh, but that is going to be one thing that we're, that I think that we have to be laser focused on is making sure that we have uh, training schedules that are out. I know when I would show up at an installation, even if it was the summer, it wasn't 45 days and my wife was asking me, okay, can we make plans for the holidays? What's going on? And people want to know that. So I think that that's really important um, to quality of life. And the last thing I'll mention, uh, I know we're going to have a bunch of good questions is, Every one of our installation has uh, Army Family Action Plan. So 
uh, I know I did this, and I've been a senior installation commander at uh, Carson and out at JBLM, and I'm encouraging everybody, and for all commanders out there, get your folks together, get your soldiers and families together, find out what's needed in your local community, what you're doing, um, and they need to do to help. We will take a lot of those, we take all those suggestions and we review this twice a year. General Pyatt's up here, he just did that this summer, and we're able to solve problems that are Army-wide, but a lot of those problems, uh, with those ones that can't be solved locally, will come up here and, and uh, we want to help with that. Hey, everybody. Appreciate those claps out there. I'm not sure who that was, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, no, I, I uh, you know, th this, is a, this, is a, uh, this is an event that I know everybody looks forward to, and I'm going to be short and brief to get to the questions so we can start having some dialogue. But um, I have a very non-traditional 30 years of service myself, but I have a very traditional um, upbringing in the Army as an Army brat, three tours overseas. <laughs> For a total of nine years, lots of moving around, three different high schools. The, you know, I'm, a, I'm a product of uh, Doty schools, um, and uh, and so so I do feel confident to be able to speak in in this space. Um, but I also learned a long time ago to leverage uh, the strengths that I have, and one of those is my wife. And uh, and I'm fortunate that uh, she's really three quarters of Team Weimer. She's been able to travel. With, uh, with Patty and, uh, and the chief and I. And for those of you, that might be where the claps came from. For those of you that were maybe coming from Alaska or Cavazos uh, from two of the most recent trips, that you know um, Miss Patty and Kimberly are absolutely diving into a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. And, and I think it's important for you to know that, uh, you know, that, that, that is a priority for us. And that information goes directly to, you know, if, if Kimberly and I are on a trip separately to the chief and the secretary, if we're on a trip together, it goes straight back up to the secretary. And I just think that's important for you to know. It's not just our perspective that's making it up this high. It's, it's a spouse's perspective. And, and I know, uh, having been in this uniform for a while, I have a different perspective than my spouse. And so I just wanted to share that, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. So as Holly mentioned earlier, uh, we will use an interactive presentation program called Minty for live polling to see what topics are out there and that are important for you today in this discussion. As we cover topics today, if you have a question in the audience, please write it down on one of the question cards, and someone will come by and pick it up. We also have mic runners, um, and they will run a mic to you if you want to ask a question in person. If you are attending virtually uh, and you have a question, please use the live chat. We have incredible experience and expertise today, and we look forward to the great discussions that we're going to have. So we're going to start with an icebreaker, a few icebreaker questions, just to understand who we have uh, here and get acquainted with uh, this app, Minty. Okay. All right. So, are you attending virtually or in person? <laughs> I hope you know where you are. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. That's nice. Uh oh, there we go. Mm hmm. Still going. Okay. All right. Okay, so I think we have a pretty good idea of where people are today, so. Uh, yeah. Hopefully the fire marshal doesn't. Uh, yeah, I, I hope there's no fire code. <laughs> I think it's 500, though. We'll be good. Okay, all right, so it looks like uh, predominantly in person, so that's great. So it'll be some great live discussion here. Uh, and we do have folks virtually. I don't want to discount them as well. All right, the next question. Are you a soldier, family member, DOD civilian, contractor, or other?
Wow. Okay. It, it will continue to populate, but I think right now it looks like we've got more uniform. We've got a lot of family too. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit of Army civilians. It's great. So we kind of know who's in the room. Okay. All right. We'll let that continue to populate. The next question. Let's see the experience you have with AUSA. Let us know how many times you've been to our AUSA conference. Okay, good. Awesome, good. Okay, it's still populating. All right, so we have predominantly soldiers here. We have the experience is pretty high. We've got quite a bit of family members as well. So, all right, and we got more people here in person. So, all right, so I think we'll let that continue to populate. Now, we're gonna get to the first question, which is gonna be, you know, again, input from you all in the audience. All right, what are your quality, what are your quality of life concerns that you would like our Army senior leaders to discuss with you today? Ooh, okay, all right. Wow, that, that barracks is a... No shortage of topics. <laughs> That's all on me and Omar. <laughs> awesome. That's a lot of topics. Yeah, That's a lot of okay. Topics. All right, okay, so it looks like the, yeah, okay, I have a good read, I think. So. I think we got the idea. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to so let the we'll secretary. So we'll be here for yeah. three hours. I, <laughs> so I'm going to let the secretary start. Uh, I think we got a good feel of what was occurring there. It looks like, you know, so secretary, if you want to kind of talk about some of the things you saw in the middle, um, I think it was bare spouse employment. Sure, so I'll start absolutely. With you. Um, so, you know, what I, what I saw is sort of the big three yeah. were barracks, housing, <laughs> and spouse yes. employment. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with barracks. You know, I think this is an area where we've really put a lot of time and money into, and we will continue to do that. Uh, but as I said in my, my keynote on Monday, you know, we're the service with the largest inventory of barracks, and uh, we have a six and a half billion dollar backlog to really, you know, bring all of our barracks up to the kind of standards that we'd like them to meet, and that's going to take some time. Um, but we are making progress. We have been investing a billion dollars a year um, across all three compos in barracks, you know, mainly focusing on permanent party barracks, but not exclusively. The, the chief and the SMA and I are working uh, as, we, as we put the finishing touches on the FY25 budget that we'll send up to Congress and talk to them about in the spring. We're trying to you know, increase the amount that we're spending on military construction for barracks. And we're really working, and I think this is going to be important, to be able to, to um, fully fund sustainment for our barracks. We have been sustaining our barracks at about 85% for the last few years. And I think if we're able to get that up to 100%, that will help us um, you know, at least try to keep us from falling behind in some of those aging barracks. We're also really trying to work on um, improving our oversight, frankly, of barracks. You know, I'm sure many of you saw the various news articles about the recent GAO report, uh, which was talking about the entire department, not just the Army, but we're going to take all of those recommendations on board. Uh, we're having um, a barracks summit at the end of this month to really bring people together to, make sh to talk about how we can improve our oversight. We did a survey of permanent party barracks, I think, at five different barracks to try to hear from people what their concerns are. Um, so we're doing a lot in that area to really try to make sure that our soldiers are living in the kind of accommodations that they deserve to live in and that we want them to live in. But, but I would also ask that you um, be patient with us because we do have a pretty flat budget and we want to make sure, obviously, all of our soldiers have the equipment they need, the um, training hours they need. You know, we obviously want to make sure that we're investing in salaries and um, 
all of the other things that we have to pay for. So, um, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to solve everything overnight. Um, one thing I will say as I, as I shift to housing, something we are going to do, I think, is explore potentially a privatized barracks. Uh, the Navy has a, has a privatized barracks, I don't know if that's what they call it, out in San Diego. I think it's called Pacific Beacon. And we are talking about potentially doing something like that starting at Fort Irwin. Um, there are, there's a lot of issues potentially with, with privatized barracks. That would be a big shift. But it's something we're looking into because it may work in some places. It may make sense for us. Um, on privatized housing, you know, again, we continue to, to work with our privatized housing companies uh, to try to make sure that we're increasing our inventory and maintaining our inventory. One thing we've really been focused on when I've talked to CEOs of those companies is um, pay attention, you know, make sure that you are recruiting and retaining a workforce that has a customer service attitude because, you know, we want to see improvements in responsiveness to maintenance orders. And I, and I think in the, in the communities that I've visited, for example, I was at Fort Leonard Wood not too long ago, I did generally hear that um, work order responsiveness times are improving. So that's something that I think is a good thing. Um, I'll just stop and kick it over to the chief and the SMA, but spouse employment. This, I'll be honest, is one of the things, you know, in my tenure um, where I, you know, we still have work to do on spouse employment, trying to help create more options for that. We're really looking at, you know, what can we do with direct hire authorities? Um, we have the um, My Career Advancement account that gives up to $4,000 for spouses who want to get educational opportunities. I think we've, we've got over 1,300 spouses who have taken advantage of that. But one of the things I'd like to see us make more progress on is getting states to actually implement the law that Congress passed saying basically that your professional licenses should be transportable to any state in the country. And we've seen, frankly, uneven implementation of that. So that's something I think we need to really continue working with governors all across the country to get that law implemented. Okay, I'm just gonna add to what the secretary talked about. So the other thing that uh, we need to do is to increase, and this gets to oversight, but also just helping us generally on our installations is our Department of Public Works have been cut, I think, in some cases too much. Our engineers, the people that do some of the oversight, that start to do the future planning, we've gone through some of these budget drills in the past. So the other thing that we've asked everybody to look at, and I uh, see uh, General Jones is right up here shaking his head up and down, is what do we need to do to increase, get the right expertise, at our installations to make sure that we are doing the right things by our housing, our barracks, and all of that that, that they oversee. The other thing that, uh, and the secretary and I were talking to some professional staff members last night, I, th I think we have to take a look at the rules to be more efficient. There are a lot of rules that we are implementing in, you know, for, for our, our dollar doesn't go as far, I think, as it could because there's a lot of restrictions on how we have to, you know, we have to spend our money and what we have to do. And so we are gonna, we, part of that conference that we're doing here later and we're getting with the Corps of Engineers uh, with the Installation Management Command is to see what we can do to go back and ask for some relief on that uh, with Congress. And I'll give you another example that from, I was just out at JBLM and we have uh, SHPO is another one, which I, I love historic sites, but the Army has a lot of historic stuff out there and some people call it historic and <laughs> Um, some people call it old. I might be in the, in the latter category. And so we, we spend a lot of money to try to upkeep stuff that, you know, to fit a certain requirement. And I think that our money could go a lot further. We could do a lot more. So I think we have to look at that. On, on spouse employment, the only other thing uh, I would add is that, uh, and this gets to getting information out, I think since 2019, and we have spouse licensure reimbursement Across the Army, I think we've only given out to like 800 spouses in, in four years. So there is a process out there to do that, and we just got to make sure. I know that there's been a lot more than 800 spouses that have you know, gone through the licensing process, and we 
you know, have something in place to reimburse them, but they're not taking advantage of it. So we got to do better at getting the information out. If there's other problems with that, let us know what that is. But I think that's a big benefit. And the secretary mentioned, you know, state to state, we don't control what each individual state does as far as, pat, you know, licenses being good in each state. Um, but trust us, we are talking here on the Hill to, you know, the, the congressional members. And then I also encourage all the installation commanders out there and sergeant majors to talk to their local, because that's really what will make, um, will make a difference. Really, the only thing I'll add on there on, on the barracks is we're getting ready to do the barracks summit, which is uh, it's a it's a it's a big event for us, and we're going to be talking about quite a bit of quite a bit about this, one on the sustainment side, uh, but also on uh, what is what are, what do new barracks look, what should they look like in the future, you know, a barracks is a place where uh, cohesive teams should be built, uh, barracks is a place where we should know our squad mates. And uh, so we're getting ready to get after that. I look forward to that, sir. I see uh, MCOM G9 and AMC is all part of that. And, and uh, that, that's a piece to this also, because every dollar that the secretary referenced that we're going to increase in sustainment and that we're going to uh, put into future MILCON for barracks, we got to make sure it's right. OK, we got uh, the mic in the audience. Good morning, question. Madam Secretary. Uh, my question is, in recent years, we've received much needed pay increase and BAH increase to counter the cost of living. However, as soon as those pay increases are announced, the surrounding community increases the cost of living and the rent. In the last year, my rent has gone up and matched every single BAH pay increase. So it has made no difference to my yearly income. My question is, is there anything we're going to put in place to protect service members as they get these pay increase to counter the cost of living so that we can actually not live paycheck to paycheck anymore. Do you want me to? Sure. You can start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't, where are you, what I was gonna installation say, yeah, are you are at? Because I mean, it sounds very similar. I was at JBLM, that was the, it was a big problem out there. It was the, when I was out there at the first Corps commander, it was the, the property out there was the number one property market in the country, and I don't know if. Sir, I'm currently stationed in Fort Carson, so the Colorado Springs okay. surrounding area. And I you know, was the installation commander there as well, so I'm very familiar with that. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. We talk about this all the time, and one of the things that I, I did up at JBLM, so I think this is, uh, to your larger question, you know, some of this is capitalism, and it's very frustrating to us so you, when you go out there when, and they're facing inflation, and so everybody's looking at the same thing. So one of the things that we've just discussed, because this it happens at different locations, is is there a way that we could give a tax break to people who rent to the military, that it might be a way that we could do that, that we could keep the cost down. I don't have anything you know specific to you right now because we don't control all the people out there that have housing and you're you know out there competing with everybody else for a house. And I think that that is a challenge. The other big thing that I noticed when, like at JBLM, for example, when you're looking at rent was credit checks were a challenge, where you were going to live. So we stood, we actually hired some ex real estate experts out at JBLM, set up a specific office to help people when they were coming in. And we tried to find military friendly renters. And so what we would help them with is getting the right people. They knew that soldiers and their families coming in were gonna be, you know, take care of their place and they could have, you know, consistent renters that were, that were in there. And then we were also able to reduce a lot of the credit checks because that, so credit checks is, is, was typically a problem out there. And I don't know if that's still a problem out at, at, at Fort Carson, but that was one of the problems. You go to different locations, weren't able to get the house. Um, and then whatever you had to put we also had challenges with how much did you have to put down as a deposit. So I think that there's ways that, that we can do that. The only other thing that I'll mention is, and I did this out at uh, Joint Base Lewis-McChord, was you can do out of cycle BAH. Um, you, you actually put it in and say, hey, we need to do something, the price is gone, because we do this DOD wide. And the last thing I'd mention just to everybody, I constantly encouraged when the housing survey came along, was getting everybody to take the dang survey and make sure that they were inputting the data and talking about the real costs. 
And what locally, what our DPW was doing was there were certain areas that we knew people didn't necessarily want to live because of the neighborhood, taking those out of the survey area as far as what the cost was in the local area. So it's a pretty complex, um, there's more to that formula. And I'm looking over at General Jones. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think I got most of it. Sir, to your point, the senior commanders, uh, as they designate those neighborhoods where Army families are actually living, making sure that's where we're getting the data so it really reflects that true cost that impacts the families. But those garrison teams will do that to support senior commanders and make sure that it's reflecting as those BAH rates are calculated. Yes, sir. So there may be a cheaper place where the rent's cheaper right outside, but it may be not where military families want necessarily to live. And so we want to take that off of the survey and make sure that the cost is calculated, and I think that that helps as well. I think the other thing we can do, <clears throat> you know, as General George says, this is a little bit, you know, the dark side of capitalism, if you will, um, because, you know, landlords are, are doing what, you know, is in their, their own interest, and it is sort of, I call it kind of the, the housing arms race, where you just have this, like, escalating set of increasing rents, for example. But so I think what we need to be doing is you know at our level here nationally, the chief and the SMA, SMA and I need to be talking to members of Congress, to the members who sit on our oversight committees and highlight this issue to them. And our garrison commanders and our senior commanders out at installations need to be talking to the mayors, to their congressional delegations, because one of the things we do when we decide where to increase our force structure, for example. You know, we've got a lot of new capabilities coming into the United States Army in the next few years, and we're deciding where to put them all around the country. And, you know, we do something called military value analysis, where we sort of look about, you know, where do we have enough space to do training? But we also look at community value analysis. You know, how supportive are the communities around our installations? And that's a way for us to put a little pressure, frankly, on some of the property owners, is to work with the business community and the local authorities to say, hey, if you all are constantly raising rates every time we raise BAH, that's not supporting us, you know? And frankly, it's just making it harder for everyone in Colorado Springs to, to be an affordable place. So I think that's something we can be doing maybe a little more of, is to kind of highlight this dynamic and show how you know, it's, it's in kind of all of our interests collectively to bring a little bit of a stop to that. Awesome. Okay, I think we have, okay, we have another mic. You can direct your question to one of the Army senior leaders if you like. Yes, good morning. For families like mine enrolled in EFMP, we've seen a lot of changes in the program in recent years, but when the quality of life initiatives came out for all Army families this year, we realized that we were left out of the topic in every single one of those. Our families experience all of those issues for different reasons. And so the question we have is, what's being done to address the specific needs of EFMP families within the quality of life initiatives? Yeah, why don't I start with that? Um, we know that you know there are a lot of challenges for our families who are in the EMF, the EFMP program, and uh, we are we are trying to better support that program. I'm sure you're familiar with the E EFMP. Um, system that we put in place to try to sort of make it easier to be in the program. One of the things we're doing is creating an, an office at headquarters to really try to help oversee that and make it more customer friendly. Um, you know, I, I think we very much want to support folks who are part of that program in the best way possible. So if there are specific areas where you feel like we're not meeting your needs, we want to hear about those. You know, I, I will say that one of the challenges I think we're facing that touches us across the board on healthcare is the shortage of just healthcare professionals, whether it's behavioral health or other kinds of doctors, nurses, medical specialties. And because of those shortages, I think it is creating um, cases in, um, in some places where families who are enrolled in the program may not be able to be assigned, whereas they were five or six years ago. But what's changed is the availability of providers sometimes has, has decreased in the last couple of years. So I think that's a particular challenge that you know, we've got to work through, but it's a national one. 
And that and that's that's one that's come up a couple on a couple trips we've been on and and we've gone straight back to our G9 teammates to you know feedback on the app and feedback from families but also the providers trying to make figure all that out. So I mean I just see so it hasn't fallen off. I mean that's the main thing I want you to know. Um, matter of fact that was a month ago we were having this discussion. Right. I would be interested just maybe not for now is what feedback you had on the app because one of, one of the other things that we said was hey it was some people had some trouble working with it so um, to the secretary's point if you know specifics and then you know hopefully we could get that also on the app so that we can deal with those things um, when they come up okay okay we have another question from the audience state your question and directed one of the ASLs thanks Good afternoon, good morning, uh, ma'am, sir, Sergeant Major, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bonner, Army Reserve, AGR. So my question has to do with homeschooling families in the military. And so those of us that choose to do that in PCS a lot, you, you find that every state has different rules um, on how you can homeschool your children. And sometimes, in some locations, you can't at all. And so what I'm asking is for the Army or DOD to look at something that helps soldiers navigate that prior to either getting PCS orders or getting to that state and realizing that they can't educate their children um, consistent with their cultural and religious traditions. Over. Thanks for that question. Uh, you know, I know that, frankly, the population of, of families that homeschool has really grown in the last few years. And as a matter of fact, my, my husband, we're a second marriage, but my husband's kids were homeschooled. And, you know, he was a Navy officer, and I know they had some challenges. I think that's something um, we should take back. I don't know, General Vereen, yes. whether, whether you have more to say about how, how we can make sure that we're getting information out for our soldiers and families about states' different approaches to homeschooling, but I think it's something we should look into because, again, I know that the number of people in this country who are homeschooling, for whatever reasons, has grown significantly. Right. No, no, ma'am. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we, we'll take that one on. We do know since COVID, I mean, schooling has significantly changed, and so we do have an a, a enormous amount of families, I think, that are doing that now. And, and not going to put them back into normal schooling, and that's fine. Uh, but that's one I think we can take and, and we can kind of work with you. So if you can just make sure to connect with either me after the, uh, the session, I'll, I'll be interested to get your details. So thanks. I'm just going to, I want to add, this is one, th again, this, what you're asking about is information. And so one of the things, and this will be helpful feedback if you could provide that, um, like I mentioned earlier on the app, and there's, you know, the big schools is obviously one of the big buckets when you're moving that you want to know about. Um, whether it's homeschooling or something else, because in my experience, raising our kids, and they had three different high schools, every time they moved, it was, you know, this, you had to know you have to take this history before that, and, you know, we went through that at every location. So I think what, we're, what we need to do is provide wherever you're, wherever you're moving, and I've had um, the discussions already, this needs to be it's the same for Compo 2 and for Compo 3, where you're at when you're moving, to make sure we have that local information. So we'll have to tailor that um, specifically, not just to installations, but across all three compos. And we're talking about that already. All right, uh, cards, mics in the room. <coughs> okay. Oh, you, okay, I'm sorry, One back in the back. Right in the middle. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Karen Rudicelli with the Military Officers Association of America. Um, I have a question about TRICARE. Um, TRICARE it was a key component of the compensation and benefits package that sustained the all-volunteer force over 20 years of war. Um, over the last several years, we've seen several cuts to TRICARE, including fee increases and decrements to access, such as the recent pharmacy network cut. Um, and we are concerned at MOA about the potential impacts here, not only on readiness, uh, operational readiness, family readiness, but also on recruiting. Um, as military families and retirees who are being hit with one decrease to the next on the TRICARE benefit become less likely 
to recommend military service to current and future generations. Um, we know that the Defense Health Program budget has been under considerable pressure, um, and so the question is, you know, what can we do to protect this benefit, to make sure that commitments are fulfilled to those who've served, and that the benefit is there for future generations? Thank you. Thanks for that question, Karen. Um, and if we have someone from our Surgeon General's office, they might be able to give you more details. But I think, you know, um, health care benefits obviously are a huge issue. And one of the things that, that I think we really need to work on with DHA is making sure that we have as many providers as possible around the country who accept TRICARE. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is the number of providers um, who are accepting TRICARE is going down in some areas. So that's something we need to work on. You know, I, I will say we had a big meeting. Um, Secretary Austin chaired a meeting a couple of months ago looking broadly at the military health system and General Crosland, who I think some of you may have been able to talk to um, earlier this week at a, at a smaller family forum, she was there. And actually, I think from a recruiting perspective, the, the health care benefits that we offer through TRICARE are still very, very competitive with, um, you know, private sector insurance, if you will. We have a lot of data that shows how TRICARE stacks up compared to civilian care. And as someone who, frankly, has spent most of my life on the civilian side of health insurance, um, you know, the, the grass is not greener, I will say. There are a lot of challenges, you know, on the private sector side as well. So I think we do need to focus on making sure we are vigilant and, and shore up our healthcare system, but I think it's quite competitive with a lot of the private health insurance companies. I think we have Surgeon General. Go ahead. Secretary Warmoth. Hey, I'm Brian Lyon. I'm uh, General Crossland's deputy, um, who does a lot of this stuff and responsible for the TRICARE health plan. Uh, so you're correct. We've had lots of changes to the TRICARE health plan, the TRICARE dental plan, the TRICARE pharmacy plan that have all come out from congressionally directed requirements. And so we have to answer to Congress on that. I, I fully agree with Secretary, we have to get more people into our hospitals, uh, doctors, nurses, physicians, and we're working um, aggressively on changing some of our uh, title authorities so that we're competitive with the VA, so that we're not just held to Title X responsibilities, but we're actually able to hire and compete with the VA because the VA can pay their doctors and their nurses and their technicians more. So getting that same authority to us to be able to hire people immediately out of school and to pay them more to have them work within our military treatment facilities. Since COVID happened, a lot of private insurance insurers no longer accept TRICARE. And so around many of our, even our large places like Fort Cavazos and, uh, and Fort Liberty, the numbers of people that actually accept TRICARE have gone down. And so what we're seeing is increased length of time to get appointments out in the civilian sector. How we're trying to answer that is obviously bringing more people within the military treatment facility but also using a lot more virtual appointments. Um, so not everybody needs to be seen face to face. And so by expanding our virtual capability, either real time or um, they put in a consult and they'll be seen asynchronously where we can answer the question or the doctor can actually talk to the primary care provider, the nurse practitioner, the PA that's taking care of them to answer the question so that they don't have to get referred out. And so we're establishing virtual care networks across the Department of Defense to be able to, to get after some of those things. Ma'am, I hope that helps answer your question. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to go back to the far back here in the corner. Well, I to give you thanks to the honorable panel. Um, I really would like to have like a, a question, like importance question in a form of comment. It's, it's very seducing to take care of the material part of the quality of care because it use uh, or it requires a huge budget. But I recall the Honorable Christine last year saying about uh, how a strong, resilient, trained army is essential. So what is the focus on the mental health and the aspects of 
I would say mind resilience. I have been volunteering for the last 15 years out of Kuwait, the Association of the U.S. Army, and I can see appreciation of even volunteered resilience programs done in the installation. So uh, in, in other industries like finance, there are 60% that don't admit that they are subject to one way or another from mental illness. It's a taboo, and I think the Army is the most significant in the world, especially the United States. So I, I would volunteer in resilience programs myself, and I would like to uh, know your take on that. Thanks so much. Sure, I'll say a couple things, and I know General George has strong feelings about resilience, and the SMA does as well. Um, one, you know, our health and holistic fitness program puts a lot of emphasis on building resilience for our soldiers, and I think we've seen some really powerful results from that program, and we're actually trying to expand our investment in the health and holistic fitness uh, sets that we've been in, um, bringing into the force. The, the second thing I would say is a lot of our um, installations have resilience programs. Like I was at Fort Riley earlier this summer and they have a program called Operation Victory Wellness that is really aimed, on, aimed at um, wellness, you know, physical wellness, mental wellness, building resiliency. And again, there they've seen very positive results. Um, they've seen you know, an actual measurable decline in harmful behaviors at Fort Riley, you know, whether it's prevention of suicides or fewer DUIs, fewer domestic violence incidents. And, and you know, I know we have other installations around the country that have programs like that. So I, th I think they are really important. Yeah, first, we love volunteers. So I heard you say you're gonna volunteer, so we'll sign you up um, right <laughs> after this. But uh, I, I think the other thing, too, I always start with units that um, are out doing their unit mission and training together and doing tough, realistic training. I think that that builds resilience in doing those kinds of things. Um, and we have statistics generally bear that out when they're out and they're you know, communicating directly. They're not on their phones and they're doing the things that they're doing, which I think is important um, and obviously critical to us as Army to make sure we maintain readiness. The other things are that we, we look at, and again, this gets back to the programs. A lot of the times when people have challenges, their relationship challenges or their financial challenges. And I like to tell everybody, if I, I, I'm thankful that when I was a private, that you know, I didn't have to buy a really expensive phone and have the ability to sign up for Hulu and YouTube and all those other things um, that I know are very tempting out there. But you know, financial things as well, because I think that that presents challenges um, in people's lives. So you kind of mentioned it in your question. I think health and holistic fitness is, is, a, is a broad approach um, to things, and it starts in the units. And again, we want to tailor that. It's different at, at Fort Irwin on, on what they need and the gyms and the things that are there and the food that's available and all of that, that we tailor it to each individual location. And, and it's the same thing with being able to provide health care. That all changes depending on what location that we're at. So. Great. Yeah, the, the, the only, thing, only thing I'll add on that, and I know the Secretary and the Chief are passionate about this, and we were just down at Moore. I mean, it, it's unfair to assume that all the soldiers coming in right now are coming in with the, some of the same backgrounds that we had. And, and so, you know, that, that onboarding that the Chief was referencing a couple questions ago, that really begins at the first contact with the recruiter, then the MAP station, and then when you board the bus or the plane and you go to your basic, basic and AIT, and, and we're leaning into adding some life skills training in there. And they're already doing this. We're just going to lean into it a little bit more um, because it's, uh, it's a bad assumption to think that uh, every soldier to the chief's comment on, you know, uh, managing your finances has the same level of knowledge came into the Army with that. So we're leaning into that um, across the Army uh, to, to build some resiliency before the life stressors that we know are inevitable because that's life. So that's one thing we're also doing um, instead of just waiting. Because um, again, resiliency starts left, mm -hmm. way left, right? You want to be good at a 12-mile road march? You better start road marching way left. It's very similar in this space. Great. Hey, so we're going to just make one quick change. I'd like to, there's some great topics, and it looks like we, we talked about schooling, tri-care, you know, spouse employment. Um, some of our medical uh, challenges. 
uh, and holistic health and fitness. So let's see what the next question here, Minty, and we kind of get some audience participation if we can do that. Maybe Drava. Okay. All right. So when you discuss as a family whether you continue to serve, what impacts your decision most? And we're looking at this. I got to go to the big screen. I brought my glasses. <laughs> I did bring my glasses. I can't see it. Salary. Okay. Okay. Looks like salary and operational tempo. Hmm. Okay. Um, Army senior leaders, you want to? Talk about one of those. Okay, yeah, I'll start. Um, so first, on the on the salary side, maybe I'll. I know the Sergeant Major of the Army has been involved with this with the quadrennial defense review. So that's in progress right now of taking a look at what um, we're going to do. And I know there's been cost of living increases based on inflation over the last couple of years, um, but they're looking at that holistic. Um, I wanted it. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the operational tempo thing because I think that that's uh, critically important, and it, it does. You know, that's been my experience as well. And it's one thing uh, to be doing your mission; uh, it's another thing. It uh, oftentimes operational tempo is not just deployments. It's how long are you in the field? What are you? When are you at home? What are the other things that you're doing? And so we are focused on that. What are the? What are? And I said this yesterday at the Eisenhower lunch, and, and been talking. Uh, to, to leaders throughout the Army, what are the things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing that are taking time away from being home? Um, there's several of those I can give uh, that I mentioned yesterday with how much we're maintaining vehicles as an example or how much you have to look after your equipment. We have 100 captains, uh, NCOs, first sergeants, warrant officers that we are meeting with today. We pose this specific question to them on Monday, what are what specifically should we take a look at? What is causing, you know, what is taking your time? We obviously have to train for our mission. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, the Army is in high demand, and and that's been the case for many years. But what are the things that we can reduce? And then we also have to look at. We do have to learn to say no on certain things, and that's exercises. We are looking at how we can line up exercises better so that we can get after. Let's say you're doing a CTC rotation and a warfighter and all those things that line up. So I think there are things that we can do to get after operational tempo. Um, besides the, what we're going to get back from the uh, company commanders and first sergeants that we're talking to today, this is a topic that we're asking all of the leadership to come back to us when we have our professional forum here in, a, in about two months. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is um, Predictability, and the chief spoke to this, um, I think, in the press conference that we all did on Monday, is, you know, if we're able to give our soldiers and families more predictability, I think that, that helps with the operational tempo piece. And I know I was struck when I first became secretary, a number of our four-star generals and three-star generals that talked to me said that training management was a skill that some of our, um, you know, um, more junior officers weren't as... Um, weren't as proficient in as when they were at that level earlier in their careers. And I think, you know, over the long years of the global war on terror, that wasn't something that um, we spent potentially quite as much time on. So I think really making sure that we're emphasizing the importance of training management to try to give our soldiers and families as, as much predictability as we can give, you know, in, in what is, um, unfortunately, a pretty unpredictable world right now. And some of that is inherent in the job of the United States Army to protect this country, there's some unpredictability, but we want to do everything we can uh, to give as much as we can. I actually appreciate you saying that, Madam Secretary, because again, um, the, the, the op tempo piece, it's a tough one, right? Um, again, you know, be care I'll be a little careful here, but it, there's no such thing as utopia in this space because of the, the unpredictability of the world right now, and I think that I think it's important that families need to understand that. That's part of our journey here in the Army. Um, we also are charged with able to, being able to fight and win anytime the nation calls upon us at night. Uh, I've spent a lot of time not deployed, but on reverse cycle training at night. 
Uh, so I was actually sleeping at home when my family was, you know, it is tough. It is really tough. I think the predictability that the chief was referencing is what my family wanted, even with a tough training schedule prior to deploying, prior to what we knew during the global war on terror as a, as a traditional deployment. Um, that gave us certainty. That gave my daughters some certainty. We could plan around that. Um, and that's the training management thing, I think, that the Secretary is referencing, that I know we're, we're crashing hard on that coming out of COVID. We absolutely are. We've picked up how, we're, how much training we're doing because we came out of COVID. We knew we needed to get after it. And so you're going to hear a bunch of that. Um, you're actually going to hear some of that in the next, uh, in my forum this afternoon with Force Com and TRADOC about training management and, and, uh, and how we get after this. But I really think the, the, the piece that's critical for the family and the soldier is the predictability. Um, but it'll, it will change. And I think it's important for us to be honest about that. OK. We have a card. Okay, up front. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Melissa Kreitzer. I am an Army veteran. I am a uh, Army civilian professional of 28 years, and I am a proud Army spouse. Uh, we have a very strong forum at each installation called the Commander's Ready and Resilient Council. Uh, this is a forum for change, uh, allows us to elevate our issues, our concerns, and amplify all of the great things that we're doing at each installation. The problem I see is, um, and, and this is different from each, each place we go, there is not enlisted or spouse uh, presentation at these forums. And these are the voices of our enlisted soldiers. These are the voices of our spouses to get after these things that affect our readiness. Things like spouse employment, talking about maybe dedicating some of these huge vacancies at these installations to military spouses so that we can um, have smooth transitions, so that we can uh, eliminate the vacancies, and then we can have our spouses investing in our community and our community investing in our military families. Things like EFMP, where uh, we have spouses that are ready to get out there and pound the pavement and go and see which one of these providers are interested in receiving TRICARE. There's several S SFRGs that already go out and do this in their communities. And, you know, um, and the soldiers, you know, they want to go to these warrior restaurants, but they want to go there and be able to access Wi-Fi. And a lot of these places don't have that. So if we're wanting to bring them out, not just to eat, but to see each other and to uh, look in the eyes of their, their battle buddies and see that they're doing okay, we're get, we got to give them something that brings them there, good food, Wi-Fi, maybe a coffee bar, something like that, you know, bring, bring it into uh, the new age uh, so that they can enjoy each other in a, in a place uh, to build those cohesive teams. Thank you. Great. Well, I'll, I'll jump I'll, on that one first. If okay, you go ahead. I'll, I, I know I'm definitely going to jump on that one. I think I, I, think I just added uh, R2Cs, <laughs> Rating Resilience Centers, to my list of, of things to go visit when I'm on trips. Um, I, will, I, will, I will take that one for action on the lack of enlisted. Uh, what installation are you referencing? Well, actually, don't say that. Don't say that. that. That's unfair. I don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that one for action. I'm pretty passionate about that one, especially I started off with my, my spouse's involvement and all that. So I think that, that one's, that's a space we could make some improvement in there because I do think they have a, uh, they could be an advocate big time there. Yeah. So um, I was going to ask you where you were coming from as well, but decided not to. But that, that was not my experience where I was at because no, we had all those people in the room not, and no. we're talking about that. So my point is, um, and I'm hoping that all the installation commanders and sergeant majors are listening to this as well, that's exactly what you should be doing. Yes. And uh, I don't really call it, uh, I've always had a problem with specifically with programs because I, I think that that's, you don't need a program to tell you that you got to bring your whole community together. And, and start talking about how, you know, to make your community strong, family stronger, soldiers stronger, and all of those things. And sometimes with programs that come up, like you mentioned with CR2C, we can start doing briefs that become more compliance-based with, hey, what are you doing? And they're from up here. And you have something very specific that you need at your installation. So that's what we are doing right now with the, we're doing the building cohesive teams is what we're chairing up at our level and what we would like to do is hear from communities 
what, what do you need specifically so that we can you know, provide you the funding and let you prioritize the funding? And it's not a program from up here. We're giving resources to make sure that you can have the right program because it is a little different, as you said, at, at every one of your installations. There's over 300 programs in the, in the Army on, on the people side, and I don't even want to tell you how, many, how much money we spend on them, but there's a lot of zeros. And in my experience, when I would go out to different locations, some of those were really working well, and some of them not so much. But if we're directing them from up here, then you know, they're operating, but they may not be doing what you want at your local level. So I think that's the kind of feedback that I was talking about with the Army Family Action Plan and getting together, and we'll, we'll rev that up and make sure that we're getting that. Okay. I did just want to add on, on dining options in particular. That is something that we're trying to work on. Um, a couple of things. You know, one, we're trying to um, bring in more sort of flexibility and more <coughs> options for our soldiers using things like food trucks or kiosks and barracks. So, for example, I was at Fort Wayne right quite a while ago and I saw some really great you know, kiosks right there in the barracks, which is particularly important when the weather gets as cold as it does in Alaska. We're also trying to give um, meal prep options at DFACS so that soldiers can go in and actually, you know, get something to go that they can then, you know, microwave later in their barracks, recognizing a lot of our soldiers have unusual hours. And then we're also trying to do some pilots looking at, um, making some of our warrior restaurants look more like what you would see on college, campus, college campuses, you know, where you can just go to um, take your card and sort of swipe it at different kind of, you know, different food choices, for example. So we're going to run a few pilots there, and I think, you know, Wi-Fi and the DFAC, that's the kind of thing we need to be thinking of because they are, if done right, an opportunity to bring soldiers together and contribute to building that cohesiveness and helping our soldiers form relationships. And the key piece there, you said it, it's different at each installation. So AMC's working a bunch of different options to ensure that the, the installation commanders that uh, IMCOM you know, assists have what they need based off of the footprint and the, and the tenant units that they have there. Okay, all right. We've got a question here up front. Good morning, um, Krista Anderson. I'm a Gold Star spouse as well as a spouse of a retired um, soldier. Uh, first, I would just wanted to say thank you. Uh, the opening ceremonies, when you mentioned casualty the way that it used to be, um, I can, you know, firsthand say how far it's come uh, being a member of the Survivor Advisory Working Group for the Army. Um, so thank you for everything that you've done over the years. Um, one of the things that we've discussed is if a service member passes away and the family is Oconus, there is that one move. First of all, their, their visa essentially expires because their sponsor passes away and their visa expires within about 90 days. Um, that may not be able to be changed, but the PCS portion of it, where their blue bark move, that last move, they're coming back to the United States, for example. Not all of them, but most of them are coming back to the United States. And they can store their household goods and then move, but we've looked at what it would be like to give them two moves, right? So that they can go temporarily to a home and then make that last blue bark move. Have you looked into that? I'm not sure if we've looked at that specifically. So I would ask, um, again, maybe our G9 or MCOM or IE and E if we've looked into it, that. So uh, G4, is somebody from G4 in? Or, okay, go ahead. Yeah, he's standing up. Hey, this is Major General Smith from G4. So we have not looked at that specifically, but we will absolutely bring that into our transportation policy section uh, to, to look at it. Right now, uh, for the last move for other categories, they have up to, uh, up to three years to move. But I think what you're mentioning right there nests very well with, our, with the inside of our current policy. So we'll absolutely take that on and provide you feedback. Thank you. OK, all right. Um, I think we've got one card up front. Okay, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Matt Sergeant Carrick. I'm active duty. I have a question that kind of approaches three of the main subjects, um, unemployment, our spouse unemployment, retention, and EFMP. Um, currently with the TRICARE contracts and ECHO nursing, spouses are 
you know, the primary care providers have to stay at home with the nurse. They're not authorized to go to work or to go to school. Um, so my question is, is it possible for TRICARE ECHO nurses to be approved to provide care in military CDCs to provide options for working military families with complex children? Hmm. I, I think that's something we can look into. I mean, that, that's a, a very sort of specific set of circumstances, but I think Brian, we can look can into you, that. Dr. Lean, can you talk about that? Yeah, we'll be happy. Please get, I'll be here afterwards. Uh, I'll stay as long as I need to to answer all the questions for medical or TRICARE. We'll be more than happy. This is the first time I've heard of that suggestion, um, and so be more than happy to take a look at that and bring that back to the to the Tricare program, our, our EFMP program uh, on on this. So I'll be over here at the end of the conference. Thanks. <coughs> okay. All right. We okay. It's right here where the card is. No problem. Uh, my name is Cadet Nalling from Missouri s &T. My question is about uh, deployment rotations. As the Army shifts our focus back to near-peer conflict, uh, for the past 20, 30 years, we've had rotational deployments. Uh, if we get into another peer-to-peer -peer conflict, do you think the Army will be able to maintain rotational deployments, or will we be forced to go back to indefinite deployments like that of World War II? Okay, I'll take a shot at that. A big question. Um, obviously, it would depend on. I think we got to. We would obviously have to be prepared. No one wants that. What we're out doing right now with our all of our deployments, our deterrence and assurance missions, um, building up our network of partners and allies through our exercises and all of those things. That's what you know. Basically, piece through strength and continue to do that and make sure that we're ready. Um, but of course I could en envision really bad scenarios where it would take the whole army and we would have to mobilize, you know, compo two and three, which is why they need to, you know, we have readiness for all of our compos for our total army. And then to make sure that we're prepared to actually mobilize if that was going to happen. So I think that as an army, that's our mission. That's what we, sh we have to be prepared for first and foremost for our country. And that's what we are training to do. What ROTC program are you in? Missouri s &T. You said Mis Missouri? Yeah. OK. Yeah, sorry, Major. Missouri s &T. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah. OK. Awesome. OK, we're going to take a final question, I think, from the audience, and then we're going to come back to Minty for the last one. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Charles Stewart. I'm a technologist and a reservist. I get to support our HRC Innovation Command. Uh, both the secretary and the chief, you talked about the difficulty of our soldiers and our families finding the information and the services that they need in real time. I can speak for my wife. She'd rather deal with Comcast than try to find information from the Army. Oof, Our that hurts. Wow. That hurts. <coughs> wow. I, I, that I would hurt, that but I, <laughs> I believe, I agree with you, <laughs> actually. Let, let's talk about the digital experience for our family members and soldiers, how quickly and easily they can find what they need when they need it. We haven't seen a lot of changes in those experiences and what we're planning to do to improve that. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. I want to jump in on that. I was going to say, that. this wow. is um, all you. Yep. Yeah. The, the Chief's new <laughs> app. Yeah, I know what we're doing. I, it's not the Chief's app. I mean, this needs to, we have uh, soldiers working on this right now. Software. And they have interviewed hundreds of spouses, soldiers at all different levels so that you get the same kind of user experience. Uh, so for example, if you're a soldier, you may not, in, single soldier, you don't need a bunch of, uh, you may not care that much about childcare or schools or whatever else. And it will be, it'll individually tailor to you because we know the technology exists out there to do that. So yeah, they're putting, there's a QR code I'm gonna ask I'm going to get your name afterwards and make sure that I get your feedback specifically on it. You sound like a digital native. But we are looking, we are looking for feedback on this. And they, they, have, they started about two weeks ago. That's it. Maybe less than that, 10 days. And uh, Tavia and James, I don't know if they're in here. Are they in here? Nope, oh, they're in the back. They're Come the on back. up here. <laughs> uh, I think this is important because, there, again, we have a lot of resources in the army and we are we want to provide them it's just hard and people say hey i couldn't find this or we don't have this and oftentimes we have it and if we don't yeah. have it at the army come on up here explain <laughs> what you're doing tavia and james yeah.
and where and where you're at. Yeah, Mike, yeah. Explain where you're at also. All right, good morning. Uh, Captain Tavia Clark, product designer at the Army Software Factory. We have our team here of product engineers, uh, Ben Hunter, Igor, and as well Chris Pauley. And within two weeks ago, uh, like the chief of staff of the Army said, uh, we got this problem said, uh, talking to a lot of personnel, soldiers on the ground, family members, a big population of soldiers, junior soldiers, NCOs. We was able to get that feedback and understand what are the problems that people really experience. A lot of it was the quality of life problems. And as essentially, a lot of stuff what we're speaking to, getting that information, ease of use, tailoring it to a solution um, that you're able to get the information up front in real time that you find useful is important to us, important to soldiers, important to family members. And so we have My Army Post where you can fill out a QR code, get the feedback to us so we can improve and iterate on it as we continue to build and develop. So we had the toughest audience. We, get, we did get a bunch of spouses together to, <laughs> um, to give to look at this. And so as an example, one of the things that was really impressive to me is you, you want to know what the gate hours are. And it'll, it'll actually show you the gate. It'll, it'll show you, it'll show you uh, what, how much traffic is at the gate. Is the traffic backed up? Maybe you need to go somewhere else. What's, you know, all of those things, little simple things to make life easier when you're on an installation. And it can be very tailored to when you're, well, you know, you're coming new to an installation. It will tailor the experience to you. So these are uh, a bunch of, these are nerds. That's, and I mean that. Um, in the most complex. That's, that's a compliment. That's a compliment nowadays. It wasn't when I was growing up. Now everybody wants to be a nerd. Yeah. So super impressive what they can all do and put this together. We are going to put this out and they're defining this, and uh, we just briefed all of the four-star leaders, and General Jones was in. We are going to make this happen, and it's, it's going to come out to the Army, and we want your feedback on what else you need. So, so let's hear it for these great all Army right. software factory yeah. folks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tavia. All right. Good job, nerds. <laughs> all right. Great. Awesome. Hey, so uh, we're going we're gonna to do one final question. I think we'll go back to Minty because this really is going to give us like our long range vision of what we're going to do and, and think where we are and where we need to go based on your feedback. So uh, they're rank ordered, as you see, and I think those are um, the, the, uh, the different areas they are moving now. Um, that we are looking at, that you have interest in, and you think the Army should prioritize moving forward, so. All right. Wow. Oh. Okay. It's like a horse race. It is. Yeah. You know? it's, it's almost like the NFC East when the commanders are moving up to the top. So <laughs> I knew I'd strike a nerve. Yeah. All they're, right. They're okay. awake. So looks like healthcare, housing and barracks, PCS moves, child care, spouse employment. Okay. They're all important. We, I think we have a sort of a good list of topics I think we need to focus on when it comes to quality of life. So we, we have just a few minutes left, but I want to do, um, allow the Army senior leaders to have some closing comments. So we're going to start with the Sergeant Major of the Army. Sergeant Major, why? Okay. Hey, really quickly, um, I mean, th these topics are incredibly important. Um, like I started off with, uh, I, want, I want to know when I'm traveling. I want to know what's going on at each one of the installations. Um, and my wife's a big part of that. And uh, the sergeant majors, uh, I think it's important for you to know that the sergeant majors know this has a direct impact on readiness. That's why your comment down here in the front uh, kind of got me, got me a little bit going. Um, um, and so I think, I think this is a space coming out of COVID and coming out of the global war on terror a little bit. Um, we can make some headway here. Now, that doesn't necessarily help with budget stuff that the, the secretary started off with, but engaged leadership is being slightly intrusive, right? That is truly what, you know, if you're not slightly intrusive, you're not really as engaged as you think you are. 
in this non-commissioned officer business, um, especially when you reference uh, barracks um, and housing, knowing how you you know, the status of your soldiers' barracks, knowing the status of your soldiers' uh, housing. Uh, the health care piece, uh, we're struggling on the health care piece, um, but the non-commissioned officer should probably be first to know when somebody's struggling with something with health care. Because um, again, that's being cohesive, that's being a good teammate, knowing that. And so getting that up is incredibly important. Um, I think some of the most informed meetings I've had were over lunches when we were traveling with the command sergeant majors from across the entire installations and the first sergeants. Because there isn't anything going on on an installation that a first sergeant does not know. And so I just want you to leave here today knowing that None of these surprised us today. We absolutely know they're important. We absolutely know these are priorities, and we're taking a look at each and every one of them. Now, they're all, they're all difficult, or wicked, as a good friend of mine would say. They're wicked, hard problems, um, but they're righteous. And so I, I just want to make sure you know that we care about these things. Chief? Yeah, only uh, the Secretary brought up the budget, and I always remind people that we all have personal budgets too. You all take a look at it and go, hey, there's a lot of things I want. I always give the example of, you know, having owned a house. I wanted, there's a bunch of things I wanted to fix, but when the roof was leaking, that's what I generally did. And that's what I fixed. So I think we have, we're taking a look at that. And there is, like the Sergeant Major of the Army said, there's not one thing up there that we don't want to get after. I, I think what I'd be interested in, if everybody leave here and we could collect something through the G9 is, in a lot of areas that I look in here, and I know DHA is working the healthcare, but we need to look at things that don't necessarily require money but will make us better that are policy changes. I mentioned some of those on housing and how we are able to build things with Milcon. That we could make our money go a lot further if, you know, changing some of the rules. Um, we are, you know, one of the things that we have talked about, and I know it's been looked at a long time. What do we do to reduce PCS moves? Uh, same thing on child care. I think that there's a lot, and I know uh, the G9 shop has known that I've given some specific tasks that there are things that we could do in that that I think that could make us better that are more, that are our own policies, that are our own things that we could maybe get out of our way a little bit that I think would help some of those. So besides the money thing, we, we have to look at those inside each of those areas because um, I think there's ways we can make ourselves better. I would just wrap up, I think, by saying um, I spent a lot of time with the Army before becoming Secretary of the Army, but a lot of what I saw was the Army, you know, downrange, uh, whether it was in Iraq or Afghanistan or other parts of the Middle East or in Europe. Uh, you know, I saw generally the pointy end of the spear, and a lot of what I focused on as a result of that was sort of how does the Army fit into the strategy, what kinds of force structure does the Army need, what kind of new weapon systems does the Army need, and that's, you know, that's where the Army gets a, a lot of attention in the press, for example. But since becoming Secretary of the Army, I've had much more of, a, of an opportunity to see, you know, what happens at home, what happens in garrison, and to really deepen my appreciation for everything that families do to support our soldiers and that all that our DA civilians do to support our soldiers and families, you know, back here in the United States. And I just want you all to know that, you know, whether it's healthcare or housing or childcare, we understand how important that is. You know, of course you all, all of us want to have and need to have healthy families. You know, we need to know that we've got medical care when we need it. We need to live in quality housing. And while, you know, a lot of the news coverage may be about the Army's long-range hypersonic weapon system, you know, we as leaders and all of the leaders across the Army understand how important it is to take care of our soldiers and families. And we are trying very hard to do that. We are looking at it from a money perspective, but as the chief said, there are a lot of things that are not about money that we can do to help ourselves. And these kinds of forums are terrific for us to, to make sure that we're focused in the right places and to bring to our attention some new things or some new concerns that we can maybe address. So thank you all so much for joining us this morning. All right, let's give a round of applause to our Army Senior Leaders. Awesome. 
So at this time, I'm going to welcome Ms. Uh, Holly Daly back to close out this year's Family Forum. Holly. Thank you, Lieutenant General Vereen, for mentoring today's town hall and also for your leadership, sir. So this is the end of our 2023 AUSA Family Forum series and your opportunity to provide us with your feedback. So we have an AUSA QR code up on the screen in the back and online for those of you who are online. So please take the time to complete this quick survey. This is really important for your feedback uh, that we can share with our Army senior leaders. And if you complete this survey, it'll take you to our first digital swag bag so you can get all the resources that you heard today and throughout all the forums. On behalf of AUSA, I want to sincerely thank Secretary Warmoth. Thank you and Sir General George and SMA Weimer. Thank you so much for today's uh, town hall, but sincerely thank you for your continuous dedication and support to all our service members and our families. Thank you also for providing all of us the opportunity to be all you can be. To the senior spouses and distinguished guests, thank you for your continuous support. To all our military families and service members, and especially our soldiers, thank you for being you. Know that we are here for you, we care, and we're listening. A special shout out to our AOSA chapters, especially Fort Leonard Wood and all those who are having the watch parties for the town hall. Thank you for doing that this year. To the AUSA and Army staff that supported these family, these forums throughout the week, um, Thea Green and Kevon Green, Brittany Rains, Kaylee Spielman, senior fellows, our new senior spouse fellows, Rob Hanskin and Amy Rodick, thank you so much. You are truly appreciated in executing and planning these throughout the whole year. Thank you to our incredible and dedicated planning committee. We have a work group led by um, Ms. D. Geis from Army G9, uh, AMC, MCOM, TRADOC, FORCECOM, MEDCOM, the Army National Guard and Army Reserve and other members of the Army staff. They get together all throughout the year to provide you with these quality forums. So at this time, would you please join me and rise with um, to S I'm sorry, so I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Would you please join and rise with me as we um, thank and applause our Army senior leaders as they exit the stage. All right, thank you everyone. We will see you next year.